Over the years, we've had all sorts of antennas that have been created. I think the most famous one was G5RV. That was created back in around 1942 or 43. year I was born, actually. And it survived 80 years plus, and it's still going strong. Yes, it's got its critics, but it's still a useful antenna. And in fact, I use a half-sized version myself. But there are some antennas that have been created and then disappeared. And I've come across a rather interesting antenna that was created around about 1960s, 62, 63, thereabouts. It looks promising. In fact, it looks attractive. It's a compact HF antenna that covers five bands. And yet, as far as I can find out, it's disappeared off the face of the earth. So let's discuss this antenna, which was created and then disappeared just like that. I know many of you that watch this channel or follow this channel are interested in antennas and I'm going to keep on the antenna theme for this, uh, this video. And I think we all, uh, well, a lot of us are interested in antennas that are perhaps a little bit different, but at the same time antennas that are practical. And this particular antenna is certainly practical. It's uh, 84, uh, 84, it's 84 feet long, so it's shorter than a G5RV, and apparently it covers five bands, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. And whether it covers the walk bands, I don't know because this antenna was conceived in 19 well, I think I think it's about 1961 or 62 it was conceived by none other than G4 ZU now I've covered uh, the background to um, G4 ZU in a previous video I'll just show you a clip here so if you didn't see this video you just uh, can play catch up and uh, know a little bit about uh, G4 ZU uh, Gordon Alfred bird known as dick to his friends so he obviously had a sense of humor particularly as he also designed an antenna called the bird cage i remember hearing g4 zg on the air but i never actually worked him he was born in 1918 and he died in 2005 and he worked for the what was then the gpo the general post office he worked in the telecommunications side of the post office and for a greater part of his uh, working life, certainly with the GPO, he was based at a place called St Martin's Le Grand, which is near St Paul's Cathedral in London. And I know St Martin's Le Grand because that's where I took my Morse tests back in 1960. Now, Dick designed some interesting antennas, but the one we're going to look at today... Now, g 4 zu was quite prolific as regards the design of antennas and... Each antenna he gave a name. The most famous antenna is the Minibeam, G4ZU Minibeam, and I did a video on that a few months ago. Quite an interesting antenna. Compact antenna that fits into smaller gardens. He came up with the uh, name of Jungle Job for another antenna. And then the Arrow antenna. But the antenna we're going to look at today is called the FB5. Now, not sure whether he ran out of ideas for sort of nickname for his antenna, but this is called the FB5. Although, once I tell you the, the sort of design of it, you'll realise that uh, the FB5 is a logical name. So let's take a look at this forgotten antenna. The antenna is five band antenna. It covers the five HF bands, 80, 40, 20, 15 and 10 metres. And bear in mind that in the 1960s, the walk bands didn't exist. So this is a, a true multi-band HF antenna. G4ZU made use of ferrite beads, which he threaded onto the wire of the antenna. Now, the interesting thing about ferrite beads is that when you put them or place them 
uh, at a point of current maximum on an antenna, it has a maximum loading effect. It adds inductance. It actually lowers the frequency of the antenna. So if you thread a, a, a row of beads onto a point on an antenna wire where there's a high current, you get maximum effect. It lowers the frequency. But if those beads are placed uh, at a different position on the antenna, in other words, where there's less current, then there's less loading effect. And what uh, G4ZU made use of was the fact that if you take a dipole of a certain length and put those beads on that dipole, as you change frequency, the current, point of maximum current, changes along that wire. So you could have a situation where on one band those ferrite beads are at a, a point of maximum current and therefore have um, quite an effect on the uh, resonant frequency of the antenna, in other, they, in other words they lower it, but when you change bands that point of maximum current has moved and those beads then could be at a point where there's far less current and therefore they have far less effect on the antenna. So you get the idea. Ferret beads placed at the right point on an antenna will have an effect which varies as you change frequency. And if you get the dimensions right and the number of beads right, etc., etc., you could conceivably end up with an, a multi band antenna covering, covering five bands. And I think FB5 stood for ferrite bead five bands, or it could be five bands five which doesn't make sense does it so i think fb stood for ferrite beads and the number five stood for five bands so let's now have a look at uh, how he achieved this now i've put up on the screen the uh, basic design of the fb5 antenna um, apologies for the quality of the print but uh, that's all i could get hold of and you see there's a top section which has got two 42 foot uh, lengths of uh, wire. In other words, it's a dipole, uh, 42 foot either side. Sorry, it's in Imperial, but that's how it was designed back in the 1960s. And there's also 10 foot of ladder line. Now it's shown as 300 ohm ladder line. I see no reason why you couldn't substitute that for 450 ohm ladder line because you can do that sort of substitution with the G5 RV. But if you want to be a purist and have the original, then 300 ohm ladder line is uh, the way to go. Also, it shows a feed in with 70 ohm coax cable. That was the common cable in those days. But there was a note to say that 50 ohm cable would be better. So uh, if we bring it up to the uh, current uh, day uh, 20, uh, in the year 2024. We've got a prolific amount of 50 ohm coax cable. So use 50 ohm coax cable. Now you can see where the beads are situated. There were 25 ferrite beads on either side. Now the beads specified were Mullard FB4 and the code was FX1300 or FXI300. I can't find um, the, a table that shows the equivalent uh, ferrite bead today. So that's a bit, of a bit of a problem. Some of you may have access to some old material and you can tell us what the equivalent ferrite bead would be today. Otherwise, some experimentation is necessary. But those um, 25 beads were placed either side. They, they threaded on the wire, placed either side, and they started off very uh, close, right by the junction of the 300 ohm ribbon and the aerial element. Now, GE4ZU says that um, the aerial um, is basically uh, resonant on the 20 meter band, the 40 megahertz band, which rings a bell because the G5RV antenna is basically resonant on the 20 meter band. The difference here, of course, is that the antenna is somewhat shorter. A G5RV is 102 foot long, and this one is 84 foot long, so you've got a, a saving in space. So that antenna uh, is naturally resonant on 40 megahertz. The um, Ferrite beads are placed at a voltage point as far as the 20 meter band is concerned, so they, they offer very little loading, and therefore that's how the antenna is basically resonant on 20 meters. 
It also um, enables that antenna to resonate on the 21 and 28 megahertz bands. And in, in um, the words of uh, G4ZU, um, the 80 meter and 40 meter bands more or less take care of themselves. Uh, he makes the point that no antenna machine unit is necessary. Now, I would qualify that a little bit because bearing in mind in those days, the um, transmitters would be using Pi networks, and the Pi network is all, is basically uh, a, a matching unit. So it doesn't mean to say that when he says it doesn't need a matching unit, it doesn't need a matching unit in current day terms, because um, almost certainly the VSW won't be one to one or anything like that. Um, but it will be quite low. Um, therefore, if it's quite low, it means to say that if you've got an internal a matching unit in your transceiver as most transceivers these days do then you shouldn't have a problem so the aerial resonates on five bands using the ferrite um, bead material as i say i can't find the spec for that material but i'm sure some of you watching will be able to find out the spec and find out what an equivalent is and if you do find out then perhaps you'll place it below the video a message or the you know, text note below this video now what about that 10 foot of 300 ohm ribbon well g4zu claims that it helps to produce a better uh, radiation pattern um, if that was not used you would get some breakup of the lobes so i mean I, I i can't prove one way or another but he does say that the 300 ohm ribbon um, preserves a nicer pattern on on the 20 meter band it gives a nice um, radiation pattern lobe um, 90 degrees to the run of the aerial in both directions of course but there's more to come there's more to come about this antenna stand by a call out to Waters and Stanton. I'm at home at the moment, but at Waters and Stanton, we've got a tremendous range of products. Check our website. And whether you're interested in buying a brand new HF transceiver or VHF transceiver or UHF transceiver or an antenna or some accessory, we'd be more than happy to help you. You can always give our guys a ring and speak to them. Uh, they're licensed ham radio operators, or you can go on the website, take a look. There's so much stuff. I've been on their website uh, earlier today and I was, I was just amazed how much we've got now uh, in products. Oh, well, by the way, um, I've been sent a couple of interesting products, actually. Um, one is a mini paddle key. And when I say mini, I mean mini. It's mini, mini, mini. And it would be ideal for portable operation. So I'm going to have a look at that uh, in the next uh, week or so. And I've also got a, a mini VSWR meter, would you believe? So I'm going to have a look at that as well. One or two other products. So keep in touch with us. But as I say, Waters and Stanton, we've got a wide range of products. Take a look on our website. If you've got any questions, don't be frightened. Just ring up one of the guys and they'll be happy to help you. Now, I promised you more. This is a really exciting bit, I think. You can actually stack two of these antennas. I'll show you on the screen now how G4ZU has stacked two of these antennas. And he makes the point, which I think is really interesting, he makes the point that the lower one can be as low as five feet above the ground. The spacing between the lower one and the upper one is 20 feet. That means to say the top of the antenna, the top antenna is only going to be about 25 feet above the ground. That means to say it would fit into small gardens. So the idea of this is that by stacking these two antennas, you get gain in both directions, in other words, broadside to the run of the wire, on 20, 15 and 10. You don't get much in the way of gain on the 40 or the 80 meter band, but you do get gain on the three higher bands. How much gain, you ask? Well. Unfortunately, he doesn't say. He says useful gain. So we could be talking about 2 dB, perhaps, of gain, maybe a bit better. Um, it depends on the radiation pattern of the antenna. And as I say, I've got no plot of the radiation pattern of the antenna. But he claims useful gain on 10, 15 and 20 metre bands. And he says it's at least as good, if not better, than a full-size dipole on 40 and 80 metres. So there we are. So, 
It's an interesting antenna. By the way, he also makes the point, which is puzzling really, he says that the number of beads are not critical. He used 25 beads, a group of 25 beads either side, but he says that you could use less beads. He says you could use a group of 10 beads. Now that to me seems to be quite a difference, but I don't know. Anyway, I think it's a good antenna to look at, and it's an ideal antenna if you feel like experimenting. Um, particularly in the summer when we've got some dry, dry so we've got some dry weather. We haven't got any dry weather, have we? Anyway, um, particularly when we do get some dry weather, um, it would be a good uh, antenna to do some experiments with. But it's an interesting antenna, and for whatever reason, it sort of disappeared. It's, I, I can't find any recent details of it at all. Maybe you can tell me differently. The only other mention I can find is it was offered commercially uh, in the early 1960s in the RSGB Bulletin and you could buy this antenna for five pounds, two shillings and sixpence. But that's the only mention I can find. In the meantime, thank you for watching this video. Hope it's been of interest to you. Thank you for your support on this channel. Don't forget to press the subscribe button. It tells you when there's another video coming up. And thank you for your support at the uh, uh, premises where we do all the shipping of your goods from uh, a central point now. And we aim to get those goods out to you within 24 hours. So there we are. In the meantime, you should enjoy your ham radio. You take care. And as usual, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.